Good, bad, fresh, rotten? Ask the internet and movies are always one thing or the other. But one person's trash is another's treasure. And from award show darlings to cheap guilty pleasures, all roads lead to the discount shelf. So pull up a chair and join us as we pan for gold. It's always worth a look on Bargain Bin Connoisseurs. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, uh, welcome in. And uh, I don't know about you all, but I think it is about time to talk about what have we been watching for 2021. Oh, oh man, that's right. It is a new year, Connoisseurs, and we are ringing it in by talking about maybe not everything we watched in 2021. We'd be here for weeks but oh definitely... no, fuck you. I'm going through movie <laughs> by movie, day by day, what I watched, a running count. No, don't don't mistake me as actually being that organized. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I'm Hans. I'm Ben. And I'm Aaron. Uh, but yeah, so I guess kicking this off, um, man, so a really good year for movies in general. Weird year, right? Because we had this weird, this kind of the advent of like, Things releasing same day streaming as in theaters and all sorts of controversy around that. But that does lead me to I think what I want to kick this off with is maybe not my favorite movie of the year, but probably the most meaningful one. And that was Spiral. Because where this landed, Aaron, you and I, first movie back in theaters yep. this past year. It was such a big deal to finally go, and I do think that that actually influenced me and made me like that movie more than I probably should have, honestly. But it was just so fun being back in a theater and getting to watch, actually just be in the greasy seats and eat all the popcorn and just have too many snacks. Ah, oh, such a good time. I, I think that movie is a good movie. I would recommend it, but I do have a special love for it because it was the first movie that I saw in theaters with you. <laughs> Uh, just yeah. the first movie I saw back in theaters regardless. I still remember mm -hmm. Underwater because that was the last movie I saw right before the pandemic hit movie theater shut down. Oh, so those are my okay. bookends for the the desert yeah, times. Yeah, let's, let's <laughs> talk about that a little bit. What was the last movie you saw before the pandemic and then the first movie back? Ooh. For me, the last one I saw before the pandemic was Ready or Not. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a solid one too. Dude, Ready or Not was great, although I did not see that one in theaters. I ended up watching it during the pandemic because it came to streaming mm. during the pandemic. Yep. I don't know what my last movie was before the pandemic because <laughs> I feel like I hadn't actually been to the theaters in a while. My job was still real crazy at that point because I was at that old position, and so I just never had time to make it to the theaters. So yeah. I don't think I actually... It, yeah, I couldn't tell you what I had seen well, right before. Sp Spiral was cool, and the opening was the movie that I really wanted to see, which is just Chris Rock doing undercover crime shit. Guys, give it to oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> give it to me. Oh yeah, I want the Dude. I want the fucking murder traps to be the B storyline, and just Chris Rock going undercover oh. to be the A storyline. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> Dude. Not movie. only is it <laughs> yeah, it, not only is it Chris Rock going un undercover doing crime shit. It's also him practicing his Type Five, which is great. <laughs> I wanted more of that. Yes. him just doing his Type Five at different times. Like, oh, yeah. if only, if only that was the movie we got. No, 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 no. But in all seriousness. This, uh, Spiral was a lot of fun. Uh, it's more of a police procedural than an actual Saw movie, weirdly enough. Pacing's a little weird in it, but overall, I'm kind of excited to see like what they do next with this Saw franchise. If we keep doing mm -hmm. these spinoff stuff, I think it's a better way to take it, honestly. I hope. Yeah, I missed that one, so I, I am curious about it. And you, you both, then, that was the first movie back in theaters for both of you. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So, uh, my first movie back in theaters was Mortal Kombat, which oh. I uh, did enjoy quite a bit. That was very fun. I have some quibbles, but overall, it was a good time. Yeah. Um, and uh, there were a couple of things it did that I thought worked shockingly well. Like, the, the first of which was they kind of framed, like, Sub-Zero almost as, like, a slasher villain, which I thought was great. Uh, just the whole way he was presented in that film was great. So uh, the intro was a lot of fun. There should have been more Scorpion, more of the Sub-Zero Scorpion stuff. That was when the movie was really firing on all cylinders. And the new guy, also shockingly fun. You know, it's a tight 
uh it, it's it's a rough tightrope to walk when you're like and we've got an original character just for the movie mm -hmm. and he's just super likable so it's like you know what i don't even care that they just made this guy up he's fun uh and so uh, i thought that worked pretty well too i i enjoyed it yeah it was good i i my I, I think we've talked about it the only issue i had was that one additional character that i was like we don't need this <laughs> like the new guy i thought it was weird <laughs> like there, there's this video game movie tendency to like try to explain stuff in, in ways that just don't make a lot of sense like Ar arcana just was a little odd to me like this random new addition to like mortal Kombat lore where they're like actually everybody has like an innate magical par power and it's like the kano in the movie was super fun he was just a massive asshole but he constantly kind of stole scenes yeah uh but it's like no like he's just got a cyborg guy it's not like a magic power he just he <laughs> has a robot eye it's just his deal like um sonya blade's power is she punches people really hard like it's and they gave her like a mega buster for some reason she's got like a mega man blaster it's like okay yep, i mean that's sure, cool sure. i guess but <laughs> but why i i don't understand um I, I think the most egregious example was definitely Jax, who gets, like, these super sad, like, pathetic robot arms first. So he mm. has to, like, <laughs> tap into the heart of a champion and believe in himself. And then he gets badass, cool robot arms. But they deliberately built him, like, these wimpy little, like, <laughs> sad robot arms. And it was just, it was so funny. <laughs> I, uh, I ended up not actually watching the new Mortal Kombat movie. It's definitely one of the the gaps this year. I have plenty of gaps of shit that came out this year that I just did not get around to seeing. Mortal Kombat was not one that I was, like, avoiding, because, you know, I'm sure we'll get into some Marvel movies eventually, and those I'm just kind of avoiding, honestly. But, uh, yeah, that's one that I just, I flat out missed it. So I'm gonna have to go back and watch it soon. Um, so just on the trajectory of films we saw in theaters, a film that I hated... But I've have, have rewatched now twice. I saw The Green Knight, A twenty four's The Green Knight in theaters. I don't know if you guys mm. have seen that one yet. No, still haven't. It's um, it's uh, an Arthurian legend brought to life. And uh, first time I watched it, I was like, I was a little hungover. Uh, I was in the movie theater, <laughs> and I was like, I'm here, let's go, let's go. And I I just recently watched it for Christmas because it is. There's two Christmases in it, and um, it's grown on me. It's a it's an interesting one. It's definitely an art film, uh, and yeah, I don't know. I hated it, but I've literally probably talked about it after we saw the movie for like two hours at the bar, and then I have since talked about it at nauseum just here and there because I'm just like, what the fuck was that scene about? Um, which to me is like, oh yeah, okay. It, it works. Even if I, my initial reaction was like, uh, I'm like, oh, but yeah. I, I, I've talked about it and thought about it a lot, which makes it a pretty good film. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I, I still haven't seen that, but I need to, uh, a friend of mine yeah. on Twitter referred to it as the closest thing we're ever going to get to a dark souls movie, which really <laughs> kind of sold it for me. And I love Arthurian legends. So, uh, I really kind of want to see it and just, uh, I was on a trip at the time and missed out. Uh, and now I've just gotta gotta bite the bullet and and probably pay to rent it because uh, it, it's definitely on my list. Yeah, I uh, as for movies in theaters, so we did Spiral a month or two later. Don't Breathe Two comes out, and I'm like, you know what? I've been hearing some weird stuff, but it's in theaters, and like I have a random day off in the middle of the week. I think I was transitioning jobs or whatever, and so it's like, yeah, you know what? Let's go watch Don't Breathe Two. Oh, man. Talk about a letdown. Like, it's one of those things, you want this movie to be cool because Don't Breathe, the first Don't Breathe was so fucking good. And the second one, you're like, I know it can't live up to it. But just as long as they don't make Stephen Lang, that's his name, right? Yep. Um, yeah. As long as they don't make Stephen Lang the hero or try to make him an anti-hero, <laughs> this movie will be fine. It'll be fine. No, that's exactly what they do. And they even try to add some lines where he, like, acknowledges that he's a monster or whatever. And you're like, no, you're just a fucking monster. Like, I'm sorry. And, like, I love Stephen Lang as an actor. He's fucking great. It's not his fault. But, like, yeah, that movie was a real disappointment for me. <laughs> so I did, did they put in a scene where he just turns to the camera? He's like, the real monster is all of you <laughs> and... yeah, might as well have. <laughs> fucking might your, as well your have. bloodlust for this kind of 
I, I <laughs> just entertainment. watched it, and I, I, I liked it a lot more than you did. Um, yeah. But I did know going into it what they were doing. And I, right. this is what happens, though, I think. Because the first movie has a particular scene that makes him irredeemable. And everyone knows what that scene mm. is. We don't have to say it if in case someone's right. seen it. That scene, it's like, it didn't need to be there in the movie at all. Right. It would have been right. it, just as great of a film. If not, like, I think it actually turned people off from the film because it's just such a visual gross image. So you can't redeem this character. I honestly wish they had to lean into the Spider-Verse and been like, you know this story, but in this multiverse, this Stephen <laughs> Lang. <laughs> because at that point in time, I'd be like, you son of a bitch, I'm in. He's a hero. <laughs> Let him fucking murder everyone. Right, but, you know, it's right. again, when you, you know, when filmmakers go with that extra route you know and really dig in the fact you're a villain you can't redeem unless you're just oh man gonna make him a right. villain again so. I, i'm i'm yeah. sorry i'm just still hung up on don't into the breathe verse here where, <laughs> where, where got the, the possibilities i mean do that with any horror franchise yeah. like i'd love to see like jason versus jason like let's go mm -hmm. Let, yep. let's let's right. do some of that <laughs> and the jason the jason that actually realizes that he can save kids from being bullied instead of <laughs> being a fucking maniacal yes. monster in the woods it's, I, I'm down. I I'm truly down. hope with like the Matrix coming back out this year with Spider Man's uh, Doctor Strange multiverse. I'm hoping because that's such a popular thing now that like I I think we should embrace it. Like I'm in. I just did mm -hmm. a, a movie night where I watched uh, the movie Life, that horror movie in space, and then watched the two mm -hmm. Venom movies with it. And I was like, this is a trilogy. <laughs> I refuse to believe it's not. <laughs> like it just is. And there's even multiverse right. shit in it, so let's go, you know? But, yeah, right, there you go. Right. What an arc. Starts as horror, becomes like a romantic comedy almost. <laughs> like, you, you got a lot going on there. In. In. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't breathe oh, too, yeah. man. Yeah, Stephen Lang was not as built as he was for the first one either. Um, yeah, I yeah, I don't think he was, but he's, I mean, he's getting yeah, a little dude, older. Yeah, dude, I you know? get it, dude. Like, he's... In his seventies, I believe, late seventies, something like that. Something, yeah. He's, like I was surprised, he, honestly, that he's coming back for the Avatar sequels because he's listed as like he's going to be. I think him and Sigourney Weaver both are in the Avatar sequels. It's like, huh? I'm pretty sure they both like died in in the first movie. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I'm guessing it's like a Duncan Idaho kind of situation. Speaking of which, Dune, right? Dune happened last year, and that was shockingly good i i will confess um i fucking hate dune the book i just i i don't like i struggle with it it's mm -hmm. it's not that the story does it like i like the idea of the story it's just it's hard for me to get past frank herbert's prose it's it's odd because like i love tolkien and the like but the book is a struggle for me um and and the world building like there's a lot of cool ideas and you know what? That movie made me love Dune. Like it, it was, it was kind of wild because what they did with that. I was sitting in the theater, and it's a very faithful adaptation. You know, the first half of the book, and it's like it clicked. It's like, oh my god, I get it now. This is what people see in Dune. Um, it was great, super atmospheric from the guy who brought us like, you know, Blade Runner twenty forty nine and and Arrival, which are excellent, excellent movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, yeah, just knocked it out of the park again. Um, if, if the Academy didn't just hate sci-fi for some reason, uh, I, I would really be hoping for some uh, some Oscar buzz on this one because it's got that kind of big, grand, like Lord of the Rings type energy. And I, I had a lot of fun with that. Did you guys see Dune? Uh, yeah, I also watched it on HBO Max, which I was torn about the same release, but I have enjoyed it. I have a pretty good setup for sound, though, so, like, it kind of helps. Mm. The visual isn't as big to me, but the sound is very important. And, uh, yeah, Dune, Dune fucked. Like, I saw the um, David Lynch film over 2020 um, nice. for the first time, and I didn't love it as much. It's kind of hard for me because I don't have nostalgia for it. Um, I have more nostalgia for the, the sci-fi <laughs> series, or the sci-fi movie that... Did did you did you see the David Lynch? I saw the David version, Lynch did, one. Did you did you see the Alan Smithy one? So that's the uh, one I cause... used to see when I was younger because it would always be on Sci Fi Channel. Mm, and so I remember okay. that one a little bit better. And honestly, it'd probably be bad too. But <laughs> David Lynch was a first time watch for me, and I was like, "Nah, I don't love it." And I felt bad because it was my buddy's like social distance birthday, rented out the theater, and it's his favorite film. 
And I was like, oh, man. Mm. I was like, okay. I got a little boozy, and I was like, well, if you're going to do sandworms, dude, you got to do fucking trimmers. This sucked. Look, I mean, <laughs> you're going to watch Sting wear weird underwear. Like, it's it's that yeah. kind of movie. Uh, it's, so, it's... But yeah, watching this one, um, yeah, the day it hit HBO, um, I just kind of said, uh, turned to the wife and said, let's do this, motherfucker. Let's watch it. And we did. And I was like, yeah, this is a much better film. Like, I get it now. Like, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same film, only they don't rush the ending because they just kind of cut it where it needs to be cut. And yeah, Mm -hmm. it flushes out a pretty cool world and, you know, not a lot of inner monologue. They kind of show, don't tell. It was good. I liked it a lot. I want an ornithopter now. Those were really cool. (laughs) I I liked the ornithopters in the movie. I thought they were neat. I I just thought they were really neat. I think, like, engineering. I'm not an engineer by any means, so maybe I'm completely fucked. I think they seem way too complicated to maintain and keep, but they look cool as shit flying. So give it to me. They do. Just give it to me. Yeah. (laughs) And they made lasers scary, which is impressive. Like, lasers have become so mundane in sci-fi where you used to, like, bolts blasting around everywhere. They they bust out those laser beams in Dune. It's like, oh, that's going to fuck something up. It's like this thin (laughs) line of death, and it's like, oh, my God, that's terrifying. Don't touch the laser. (laughs) I think the last time a laser was scary to me was probably watching Terminator 2 as a kid. Like the opening war scene where it's like the machines crushing the skulls and then firing all the laser weapons around. Like that's probably the last time now that you mention it, I actually thought a laser was scary. Wow. Isn't that like, so yeah, wasn't that James Cameron's dream, that opening scene? He had that dream and that's what like <laughs> yeah. inspired yeah, him to do it. <laughs> right. It's something like that. And yeah, he went absolutely oh man we can go down that rabbit hole another time there's a there is an eight-year-old hans right now screaming to just make this a terminator 2 episode dun, and dun, talk dun, extensively dun, dun. <laughs> right dun, 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 uh, dun, dun, dun. dance of the metal skeleton men uh, <laughs> right. not to be confused with the rob zombie album of the same name <laughs> <laughs> right so the only other movie i saw in theaters uh this year this is the last one on my list, and then we can go to like whatever, just free form, or what if you guys have more theater watches? But I saw F9 in the theater. Nice. And people know, you know, some people love Star Wars, some people love Star Trek, some people, you know, big Lord of the Rings fans. But if you're giving me a franchise, you know, I'm a fast boy. I gotta go fast <laughs> and I gotta go furious. And F9 delivered. It was beautiful. And I mean, talk about like. They just, they bring back everyone almost. Like, it's, it's just full of surprises and cameos from true fans. I, I cannot imagine someone watching the first Fast and Furious and going to F9 and understanding any of it. But I kind of <laughs> fucking love that Vin Diesel's like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> right. It was like, it's like Vin Diesel was like <laughs> into the camera. Hey, this is for you, Aaron. Family. <laughs> so I know you guys had, oh, I know you guys haven't man. seen it. You guys are not. As yeah, fast I, heads as me, I but am, uh, get it. I, I'm psyched for you, man. Like, just the secondhand joy <laughs> is right, infectious. Right. It's, okay. it's one of those. I, I need to see that. I've got to get into all of those. Maybe <laughs> maybe in 2022, that's Ooh. the thing I'm going to do. Who knows? Anything Damn. could happen. Well, yeah. I, I will real quick, before we jump off of fast, uh, on our Patreon over at DB Improv Collective, there is a, a, it's a bonus podcast where me and my friend Quinn, who has never seen any of these, are going through them in chronological order. There's short <laughs> films. There's films that I think inspired or were inspired by. So it's a it's a very lengthy series getting in the weeds with this. But check that out if you're interested in more of my fast talk. I'm, I'm into it. But yeah, I uh, so yeah, I didn't really see a lot in theaters this year. Obviously still a weird year, so different points in time felt more or less safe for the theaters so haven't done a lot of theater stuff lately but um a couple of notable releases that i ended up watching at home though that were uh i don't know a lot of mixed feelings on the first one malignant i do not quite understand why the internet broke about malignant it it feels like this weird thing Aaron, you and i ended up actually watching this one together at my place one one random saturday afternoon And it feels like one of those weird moments of, like, mainstream audiences just haven't seen, like, a batshit weird B-horror flick before or, like, don't see them regularly. So the internet just kind of broke over Malignant. It was like, holy shit, did you see any of that coming? I don't want to spoil things because that's not what this episode is. But for me, I'm just like, really? I mean, 
I I realize it's glossier than most B horror flicks, but like it's just okay. Like I, I I like James Wan a lot. I like a lot of shit that he does, but like this was a weird one for me that I really was just like, eh, you had an inventive villain, but that's kind of it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I was very disappointed. But again, I am very. I mean, my wheelhouse is that late. Like mid to late eighties, fucking New York. Mm-hmm. Frank um, Frank Hennenlotter is my jam, and Hennenlotter's been doing this shit. I mean, we got Frank and Hooker, we got Brain Damage, we got fucking Basket right. Case. In fact, <laughs> in Brain Damage, you see the main protagonist with a basket from Basket Case because he was doing fucking <laughs> in universe movies back in the eighties. Oh. So yeah, oh, yeah, I was not very impressed by uh, Malevolent at all because I was like, oh. You know, I would. I just want to go back and watch Basket Case. But you know what? You guys do you. Right. Whatever. I'm here. Right. It's. I'm glad people are getting into horror from it. I'm glad people really enjoyed it. Sure. I, um, sure. You know, a little too glossy for for my taste. Um, yeah. It. It is one of those where you're right. It is definitely good to acknowledge. Like that's if this is getting people into horror and this means we get more mainstream horror and we get more budgets for these kind of movies. Yeah, I'm all in for it. Let's do it. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's a great movie. I will tell you, if it's a gateway to get you into other horror movies of this ilk, hell yeah. Let's do that. Let's let's see a Basket Case reboot or whatever. Oh I don't God, care. Please. <laughs> please. <laughs> oh, oh, man. Gosh, uh, I've got chills all well, over. <laughs> I'm not as much of a horror guy, but um, something that was horror or kind of horror adjacent that I saw uh, this year... That I loved. Also in theaters, I I hit theaters pretty hard this year. It was fully vaccinated. I was just ready to go, you know. Like, um, and the Alamo Draft House in town had some pretty good safety protocols in place, so I, I felt like comfortable and confident for the most part. But uh, last night in Soho, uh, which was one of my favorite films of the year, I do love me some Maker Right and right yet again delivered uh i know this one was a a little controversial for some people who are fans of his filmography because it's a a very different kind of picture for him if you went in expecting something like the cornetto trilogy it is not like that at all it doesn't feel like baby driver or scott pilgrim it is doing its own thing but what it's doing i think rocks uh do you guys see last night in soho not yet it's on the list no it's oh, yes man. exactly it's i on don't the want list. to spoil too much about it then but i i can't recommend that enough it was super the, fun the only thing is is that you know it has it comes with that trigger warning unfortunately attached to it so it's one of those it has to be a watch on my own at some point so i need to find a time where it's just me hanging out at home by myself when I watch it. I It is absolutely, like, number one on my list of what I haven't seen yet, because I'm with you. I love Edgar Wright so much. Like, I basically have loved his filmography, and from the first time I heard about, like, what Last Night in Soho was going to be, I'm like, ooh, I'm very excited to see Edgar Wright's take on this kind of thing. So, like, I'm super excited to see it. I just haven't gotten the chance to yet. I'm, I'm probably going to make some time here very soon for it. Yeah, that was... That was a lot of fun, so I really enjoyed that quite a bit. Also saw The Last Duel. Uh, did you guys see that? I have not seen not Last Duel. a lot of people Duel. caught that in theaters. Mm-hmm. Not mm-hmm. yet. It's on my list, though. It looks weird and cool, so... <laughs> yeah, it's it's very good. It's similar to similar to Rashomon, uh, but it's, it's kind of doing its own thing, and it, it does it very well. Uh, very well-structured. Um, great movie. Yeah. So, on the thread of favorite movies of the year, though, because you mentioned that your favorite theater viewing this year was probably uh, Last Night in Soho. If I'm going with what my favorite movie for the year was of releases, getting into that, oh boy, Werewolves Within. God damn, mm. I adore Josh Rubin. Like... He's he's from uh, College Humor originally. His stuff was pretty funny back then. He does some stuff on YouTube now that's still pretty funny. Uh, but he did scare me before this, which was just fantastic. We've talked about it on the podcast before in an opening uh, bit. He directed this one, and I'm pretty sure he wrote it as well. Well, he doesn't star in this one, his humor is just all over it. This weird kind of dry bit of humor just kind of all the time very clever dialogue that's very fast with it's it's not packing too many jokes in too quickly but it's just enough that it's like you kind of you'll miss it if you're not paying attention 
And then on top of it, you also have like a genuinely good whodunit werewolf story. And it's like, oh man, I whew, absolute favorite watch this year when it comes to like the list of movies I saw. It was so good. It's this little indie budget thing, and I don't know. It's it's got it's definitely going on my list of like favorite movies from now on. I really enjoyed that one a bunch. Nice. I, I told you I just got it on Blu-ray, so I have not mm. checked it out yet. But uh, maybe on Friday, maybe for my movie night on Friday, I'll bust it out because I am. You absolutely I am should for it. And I would even argue that we should probably do it for an episode. Like it's good enough, and I think mm. it has enough crossover appeal for all three of us that yeah. we would all probably, even if not all three of us absolutely love it, I think everybody would at least enjoy it. <laughs> So. That, would, that would be fun. I, I haven't seen it, and I really want to. I heard nothing but good things. Uh, so that's that. Like, the trailers were fun. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, like, the, the movie seemed like a blast. So I, I really want to watch that. Uh, Last Night in Soho actually was not my favorite favorite in, in theaters, but it did make my top three. So it was up there. Um, I guess rounding out the rest of that three... Uh, my number two, uh, I'm, I'm a huge James Bond fan, uh, which we haven't really covered any on this podcast, but uh, we're going to have to get in some, some classic Bond movies, I think, at some point. There's a lot of those, a lot to, to chew into there. It's a franchise that's been a lot of things and transformed a lot over the years. Um, but No Time to Die uh, was phenomenal. That was uh, just an excellent end cap to Daniel Craig's tenure in the role. I adored it. Uh, it felt like a fantastic kind of uh, culmination of not just Craig's tenure, but uh, even like as the 25th film in this long running series, you know, from the 1960s, it just, it was a lot of what I would have wanted uh, in a Bond movie, it's it's fun, uh, even given like how it ends. It's surprisingly poignant. Um, th- there, there's kind of a, a a tragedy to to the finale that's just beautifully done. Um, it's got some great characters and situations that are so alien for for this particular um, role that it's just kind of wild to see. Um, you know like bond in these situations and then you've got like such a fantastic supporting cast i mean anna de armas kind of famously stole the show she's in it for like five minutes uh it's a great little knives out reunion um and uh she just gets to kick a whole bunch of ass and just kind of gracefully exit off stage um that was excellent excellent movie uh so i i love that Nice. So I guess if we're getting into, I mean, we have a, we could talk about way more, but I, I honestly think my favorite film I saw in 2021 was a little film starring Bob Odenkirk called Nobody. Did you, oh did you guys check that man, one out? jealous again. I wanted yeah. to see that. Uh, I, yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Loved it. I did cover it over on our Patreon on Monday Monday Movie Boys, the premier <laughs> action Monday movie podcast in the world. Um, yeah, it was a delight. It was a first time watch when I saw it, and uh, I still listen to the soundtrack. It's got, I call it, it's got BDE, Big Dad Energy, and it fucks. <laughs> I fucking, Bob Odenkirk, at, oh, you know, man. it's, it's, I love he's, John he's Wick. He's gunning for those Liam Neeson dollars. <laughs> I love the John Wick franchise, but nobody just has this little spin on it that just feels really good. Really good. So, yeah, I, I highly recommend mm. Nobody. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, that's definitely one that's on my list to revisit. It definitely has popped up a million times. Every every feed that has recommendations, that has access to Nobody, is always like, hey, by the way, you're going to really like this movie. You should watch it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I will. I promise. I will. <laughs> So my favorite movie that I saw in theaters this year, uh, because No Time to Die was pretty much a lock, and then there at the last minute in December, um, it was kind of swept away by another film that I was really anticipating, uh, The Matrix Resurrections, which was my number one movie of 2021. Hmm. Just, uh, man, that was... Everything I wanted and all kinds of things I didn't know I wanted, but definitely <laughs> needed. Um, 
because I love the original Matrix. I appreciate the sequels. I know they're kind of controversial. Uh, un understandably so. They can be a little bit dense and a little bit weird, and sometimes it's tricky to tell what exactly they were going for. Um, but I, I do feel that on balance, they hold up. That there's a lot of uh, creativity behind them, that there's a lot of love that was poured into them, and... I don't think I've ever seen um, a series finale, which is what this really feels like, uh, just kind of recontextualize everything that came before it so well as The Matrix Resurrections does. It kind of takes, it's like, hey, all that stuff, even even the messier bits of the sequels, it means something. It all kind of comes to a head here, and, and everything uh, that the franchise was really kind of about the whole time um it, it's an interrogation of that and it is just beautifully done it's super meta um it's been compared uh justifiably so i think to uh west craven's new nightmare <laughs> which is uh definitely an interesting angle um they, they're fairly aggressive with it even where you've got like uh a oh, warner brothers was gonna make this with or without us it's like an actual line in the movie uh right. at, at some point so it's just uh yeah, uh, that was something special. So I, I really, really love that. Have you guys had a chance to see that yet? Yep, I watched it. I did not <laughs> love it as much as you. Um, but honestly, it all comes down to one thing. And mild spoiler alert, Hugo Weaving is not in this fucking Ooh, film. Ooh, that's fair. Yeah. And, and yeah. honestly, yeah. I, I had some... It's much like Space Jam's new legacy. This is a lot of meta, property, Warner Brothers stuff that kind of icks me out um but hugo prob it probably would have been way higher on my list if i just even even just could have seen like a glimpse of hugo big hugo head right. over here love hugo weaving come on <laughs> where yeah buddy so uh, apparently they they offered it to him and he was busy and the studio did not want to wait which is unfortunate because yeah, yeah. i agree hugo weaving would yeah. have been huge in this i mean um, you got keanu I, I man say... you got keanu hugo yeah dude wait for hugo you can't you can't have the yin without the yang, you sons of bitches. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that um, while I was deeply disappointed uh, that Hugo Weaving wasn't in it, because I do love Hugo Weaving, uh, he's always fantastic, like in pretty much everything he's in. Uh, but uh, you know what? Even even without him, I thought Jonathan Groff did a great job with the material. He was an excellent Agent Smith, and while it yeah. does still kind of haunt me that. Um, weaving isn't there like this guy you know I, I thought crushed it anyway like if we had to have somebody else he he sold the hell out of it uh, so yeah. I, I appreciated that quite a bit yeah so I did end up actually getting to catch this one and that's something I was going to point out Jonathan Groff first off uh, already loved that guy to begin with he was amazing in Mindhunter if you're in for a weird kind of psychological show that's true crime adjacent you could say because it is still talking about like actual serial killers and stuff like that like if you're ever in the mood for something like that Mindhunter was a great series I'm real sad that they're not going to get the chance to finish it but regardless of that I kind of land somewhere in the middle on Matrix Resurrections I enjoyed it more than the sequels for sure um I don't think it was the most amazing movie ever, but I had fun with it. There are some things about it that I think kind of struggle a touch here and there. Um, some of the action was a little toned down, I guess, at moments. Some of the kung fu moments, if you will. But I get that. You have some actors who are aging a bit. You just don't have that same kind of physicality. But they were still doing their own stunts in the first place. So that's pretty impressive that that's happening at all. Um... But story-wise, it was pretty fun, and I have to say, Neil Patrick Harris as the analyst was also a lot of fun, because yeah. I really enjoy Neil Patrick Harris as well in most things I see him Loved in. Loved his evil monologue with, like, yeah. the apple and the bullet where he, like, <laughs> right. fires the... Yeah, it's so great. Yeah, yeah, and I... There was... The meta bits were interesting at times, right? Where it's like you have that thing where they're going over it over and over again about what made the Matrix so cool, right? And it's bullet time, you know? And it's, oh, it's about this. And it's those kind of meta bits were fun in an interesting take on it that I think this series is able to kind of reflect on itself in this way that you really couldn't have that reflection if it hadn't been 20 years removed from the originals, right? Almost 20 years anyways. And so that is all pretty cool. But... 
we end up in some weird gaps in how the story is told. Like, why did we need bugs in there for getting Trinity out of the Matrix? What's happening here? What? Why? Like, I, I don't know. You have some weird moments like that oh, where just man. we end up yeah. with this weird convoluted. We could thing. turn this into a whole episode, so it's right. probably best not so, to go too far down yeah, the, the yeah. rabbit well, holes well, there. <laughs> so I would say ultimately, I land somewhere mixed on it. There are some really go- cool things about this movie, but there are some things about it that I'm like, eh, I could, I could have left some of that. Which on the is, cutting room which floor. Which is fair. So. Like, there's, there's, like, it's... I, I think it was always going to be a bit divisive. I will defend the action in that I, I do think there was a conscious decision to de-emphasize it even, not just because of age, but because of the, the way that this is ultimately a love story. Uh, it's notable that neither Neo nor Trinity touches a single gun throughout the entire duration of the film. Mm, and right. all of Neo's, like, powers in this kind of manifest as, like, shields. He's blocking people. He's pushing people away. Um, Mm -hmm. but the emphasis is more on like their personal struggle and less on the gunplay and the, the cool, crazy stuff that usually happens. And I could definitely see how, like, if you were looking for something like that, that chase scene and reloaded or like the, the Mm -hmm. iconic, you know, like rooftop fight in, uh, or or like hallway scene, the lobby scene, uh, the lobby scene from the first one, right? Like, yeah, you would definitely be disappointed. Um, which is fair. Uh, but this is, I, I think, I'm just an excellent uh, capper to the themes uh, of the Matrix, so I appreciated it on that level. Um, but yeah, that was that was big for me. Um, did you guys see anything else that you really liked this year? So I I didn't think about it till just now, uh, but in fact, I think I Hans, I think I made you watch it. Um, going with the themes of the Matrix Resurrection, uh, a documentary release called A Glitch in the Matrix. It's by Rodney yes. Asher. Um, he did. He did that um, Shining documentary, Room 207, where it's just about all the conspiracy theories. He chooses very interesting topics, and it's all about simulation theory. Um, And it's interesting because it talks about the the murder that was inspired by the the original Matrix film. Um, A kid who, you know, had some, you know, uh, obviously some, some issues on his own, just became obsessed with the Matrix, dressed like it, and... You know, so I, I guess I didn't put the themes together of the Matrix um, Resurrection not having guns. I didn't even notice that. I noticed there wasn't a lot of mm-hmm. action, um, and I was like, "This is weird," because we know through John Wick that like Keanu fucks. He, <laughs> he could be doing right, some cool right. shit. So it, oh, it yeah. makes sense. It's purposely not, but yeah, I would recommend a glitch in the Matrix if if there's any folks out there who are looking for like a fun, interesting documentary. It's very artistic the way right. it's styled. They don't interview mm-hmm. people head on. They like skin them in avatars based on their personality. It's it's very neat. Right. Um, yeah, talks Glitch in the stuff. Matrix was super interesting. Again, especially just being an odd topic in the first place around simulation theory and kind of taking it to a place where it's talking to people who truly believe in simulation theory and that it's not a theory and th- this kind of thing. And not just leaving it, because, like, that's a topic that you could easily just leave it at, like, oh, look at these wackadoos and the weird things they believe, right? Because, like, that's really easy to do in that kind of documentary, but that's not what happens. It dives way further into it on, like, well, so, like, how does this affect your life, then? Like, how do you see reality because of these kind of things? And you end up coming to this place of, like, oh, well, yeah, no, I mean, I can see why you might buy into something like this. I I don't personally, and I don't think you've changed my opinion on anything around it, but you're presenting these people far more in a far more human way in glitch in the matrix than I think a lot of documentaries would have, you know? So yeah, definitely a cool watch from this past year. I don't know if it came out this past year, but that's the first time I saw it and it, it was great. Yeah. That's when I got access to it was in um, either late 2020 or, or possibly 2020. I can't really remember, but yeah, it is a good uh, companion piece to the new matrix. I think, I think that's a really fun Mm -hmm. idea. And again, we're getting into that meta stuff, right? Space jam legacy came out and it's all just like, Hey, look at our catalog at Warner brothers. We have so many titles. (laughs) You want to go to middle earth? Here's a world. It's this weird Fortnite skin. (laughs) I don't, I don't, I don't fucking know. Um, so I, I, I definitely want to... There's a few fun titles that I watched this year that I genuinely just adored. Um, I don't know if you guys have some like that, but like I wanted to mention Fear Street Trilogy. 
Yep, for sure. Mm. That's on my list to talk about this evening, at least as a quick mention. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't. Again, it's it's very popcorny. It's not the most, um, you know, it's not the most gritty or grimy kind of horror. It's yeah, it's. Fun. Right, it's it's not an A twenty four horror series, right? Like that's not what it is, and that's not what it's trying to be. But it's cool, and it was fun. It's it was a really cool take on the Fear Street books by R.L. Stein. It you know, kind of feels like it's for kids, but then it definitely goes out of its way to make sure the murders are fucking brutal. To where it's like <laughs> right. this seems like it's for kids because it's young protagonists. It could be mm-hmm. scary stories to tell in dark, or, or Are You Afraid of the Dark reboot? But then we get like a fucking gnarly slashing murder, and you go. Nope, never mind. This is for me. You right, know, this is right. horror. Uh, it's it's yeah. it's, and, it's poppy bubblegum babysitter horror. You know, the babysitter type Netflix gloss. But right. it still works, and it's fun. So, and part of what I think is this: what you're talking about it about it feels like it could have been a horror movie for kids, but ends up it then it ends up not being. Is like, well, that's what R.L. Stein is, right? He is that gateway for kids oh, yeah. because you start out with Goosebumps. And those are definitely more kid-friendly, and they're a little scary, but they're not too crazy. And then you move into other R.L. Stein books, and that's more basically young adult versions of what Stephen King has done. And yeah, that's this movie kind of hits that weird spot of like, if I were like 13 or 14, back when I was like first getting into horror movies, this would be a really good trilogy for that. Mm-hmm. Like, that's, that's where I think this hits home really well. I think the... The series is a little uneven, like the front half is a little heavy loaded in like how fucking good and how fun it was, but it's still pretty cool throughout. Like I I would say I still enjoyed all three of them. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the rumor is that Stephen King once said about R.L. Stein that he's the training bra for his books, which is a very (laughs) sick burn, but also like, yeah, that checks out. It's still, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Um, (laughs) Uh, I, um, Willie's Wonderland I wanted to bring up, too, because I watched that in 2021. Yep. And I've watched that probably mm-hmm. three or four times Wait, since. Wait, was, was that the, like, Nick Cage and Five Nights at Freddy's yep. movie? Yeah, it's the oh, one fuck, that was going to be I that another... was even a thing. Oh. I didn't yep. see that. It's so good, <laughs> yeah, dude. It is. You, it's you so, mentioned it's... it, and then, like, the spell went off in my mind. I'm like, oh, my God, I wanted yeah. to see that, and I forgot dude, about it. <laughs> it's so fun. You get to – so it started out for, – for those of you at home that don't know the background on this one, it – they have been floating scripts in Hollywood for a Five Nights at Freddy's movie for a long time, and none of them have actually turned into one. One of them turned into Banana Splits, which was not great, but okay. Uh, another one of them turned into Willy's Wonderland, and Willy's Wonderland is a bunch of fun. You get to watch Nick Cage almost not talk and fuck a pinball machine. So, like, it's pretty fucking great. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I, he doesn't talk for the entire movie until maybe the ending he might say one thing. Yeah. If he does, I can't remember like him talking at all, personally. <laughs> But yeah, right. he does. There is an epic love story between him, and a, him, energy drinks, and a pinball machine. And to be quite honest, mm-hmm. I have never felt as close to Nick Cage as I did watching that film. <laughs> yeah, I fucking love caffeine. Yeah, give me a fucking pinball machine. Sure, let's go. I'll beat up some animatronic demons on the way. Let's fucking do this. Right. Oh, Beautiful man. film. Very fun. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I would be I would be remiss myself if I didn't talk about um, I think the big one that everybody's been waiting for me to talk about all night, uh, you know, because there's there's one character out there that I, I like even more than James Bond, and uh, this is a movie that did after all arguably save movie theaters. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to talk about Godzilla versus Kong. <laughs> yeah, Let's I go. Was for I, it. You are right. I was, I was waiting. waiting. <laughs> I was. It's on my list. I was like, yeah. Ben's gonna cover this, right? He's gonna cover right, this. Oh, right. Yeah. Exactly. It's same here. Same thing. <laughs> no, I uh, am a huge Godzilla fan. Just one of those things I grew up with, uh, and I loved it. Godzilla versus Kong was excellent. Mild spoilers uh, for yet another. <laughs> um, film but mecha godzilla was in like a big budget american blockbuster for the second time in my life which is insane uh and um yeah uh man that was that was fun and it is true that like while the the spider-man um box office kind of ran away with things at the end of the year uh when godzilla versus kong hit uh it was like the first 
big hit in a theater since the pandemic started, Mm -hmm. uh, which is an impressive feat for a Godzilla movie, especially after um, the the previous film, which I will concede I liked a bit more, um, kind of tragically underperformed. But, you know, I can get it. Uh, People love King Kong. He's got a great arc in this. I I have to confess, I've never been a big Kong guy. And this movie made me love Kong. Like, they just, they really Mm. sold it. Like, they they lean into him as the underdog and every bit of it's gold. Like, it it works really well. You can't help but root for the guy. Godzilla gets a bunch (laughs) of cool moments. They they all get to do hero stuff. You got this big team up at the end. It just, it rules. Uh, I, I loved it. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, I uh, we definitely talked about it earlier in the year on an episode one of uh, one of the times we did, and yeah, I was a little soft on the movie ultimately because again, it's not uh, you know the big uh, monster movies aren't aren't really my thing, but I did still enjoy Godzilla vs Kong for what it was. Again, I said it in that episode too. Grew up as a King Kong <laughs> fan when I was a kid, and so it was like it was cool to see Kong. You know, I definitely enjoyed it uh, in that way. But ultimately, yeah, it's. I'm glad that it did well, and I hope they keep going with it because I know there's a fandom out there for it that is going to absolutely eat it up. So I like like most of these movies. I I'm gonna have the same complaint. Cut out all the fucking humans because I don't give a fuck <laughs> about any of those motherfuckers. <laughs> but you give me fucking. And I will say this: the trailer for Godzilla vs Kong was fucking dope. Those two fucking battling on a fucking uh, aircraft carrier. Aircraft carrier. With that music. Yeah. The sweet. Come on. Yeah. Oh. Oh. It was yeah. good, man. I really oh, enjoyed yeah. it a lot. Loop. Or, or there's plenty of plot holes. There's plenty of shit to shit on. But also, fuck you. Get the fuck out of here. This is dope. Let's fucking go. Yeah. More monsters. Oh, more yeah. fighting. Let's license all these mm. Toho motherfuckers. And, and fucking... I don't know, Disney, acquire Gamera. Let's go. Let's get some more shit out there, okay? <laughs> what are you oh, doing? Yeah. No, no, that's... I, I'm hoping that, that Legendary kind of... Because uh, you know, like, that stuff's got to be cheap relative to Toho. Like, Toho are the big dogs. Gamera was always kind of the cheaper yeah. um, character. And, like, uh, there, there's uh, a lot of talk about where they're going to go next because their their license for the Toho characters is technically, like, they would have to renew it. Uh, so they can still do Kong stuff in their monster verse, but they would have to go back to Toho and say, Hey, can we make some more of these and negotiate? Uh, but it's like, Hey, you know what? I would watch Kong versus Gamera. I would watch Godzilla versus Gamera, put all three of those in a movie. And that's the greatest film of all time right there. Like that's just, (laughs) this, this is what the people need. Like, come on, Warner brothers. You've got the cash for it. Just, uh, sure. It's a bring, bring Gamera onto the stage here. It's his time to shine. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was fun. And I will say, um, to your point, Aaron, about the the human parts, I think everybody who was like a, a giant monster movie fan as a kid, like if you grew up with kaiju stuff, um, like it's it's funny to me. People complain, but it's like, oh man, like there was only like fifteen minutes of monsters in like the twenty fourteen Godzilla movie. It's like, yeah, there's only like fifteen minutes of monsters in every Godzilla movie. Like <laughs> if you were a kid, like you were leaning on that fast forward to get to the fight scenes, and there were like three of them per movie. And, like, the, you've got, like, a collective, like, five minutes, <laughs> and the rest of it is all, like, you know, a, a obscure, like, well, like, uh, we've got to roll out the Japanese military to do this. It's like, no, you can't send them there. They'll die. And it's just people, like, debating <laughs> whether or not they should do a thing they obviously should not do. And um, that is kind of your average Godzilla movie. Um, this improved on that a bit, I thought, where you had, uh, I liked the, uh, the sign language. Yeah, we've got uh, a little girl who, uh, it's like she is, I think, deaf, and she communicates via sign language, and she can speak to Kong, kind of like Coco, <laughs> the gorilla, uh, through sign language, and it rocks. Like, all, all of that's great. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, e- even that part I thought they did pretty well here. Hell yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. So... Quick one I want to shout out before we wrap up. Uh, don't need to go too deep into it. Uh, just watch The Deep House. And I gotta say, underwater haunted house movie, ambitious fucking project. And for what it is, I think they pulled it off for like how difficult of a movie that is to make. <laughs> right? They did some interesting stuff. It's The story is a little predictable. Like It's not anything that's going to blow anyone's mind. If you, were, if you took this movie out of the underwater house and just set it in a normal haunted house, 
it would be one of the most boring and predictable movies. But you add in all this underwater stuff and they're trapped and like all this other things going on with it. It's pretty fucking cool. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I definitely want to shout out the deep house. Hell yeah. Yeah. I've got to do likewise for, uh, like a, a couple of, like, I didn't really talk about, um, all the great animated movies that came out this year. I mean, Luca was wonderful, kind of small scale Pixar. It felt like a studio Ghibli movie. Yep. Loved Luca. Highly recommended. See Luca, see Mitchell's versus the machines, oh, so good. which was also mm-hmm. wonderful. Just what a delight. Uh, and both of those movies deserve far, far more time. Um, like we, we could talk about those in depth, I feel because they, they are excellent. Uh, so yeah, check those out for sure. Uh, if you haven't I mean, yet. I, yeah. I didn't think about animated, but even, uh, that, uh, Ron's gone wrong. I checked that one out recently and that's a charming. pretty fun one too. Yeah. yeah they, they're for like mm-hmm. the first five minutes. I was like, Oh, I'm not so sure about this. And then kind of once it clicks and like Ron kind of starts doing his thing, I'm like, Oh, this is delightful. Yep. Like it, it's, it's uh, <laughs> very good. That's on Disney plus right now. Uh, yeah, no, that that's good too. And Canto, kind of yep. blew me away too because honestly i thought the trailers were kind of lackluster for that and it's like oh you know like modern disney can be so hit or miss with some of these but um damn it was good um a, a <laughs> lot of uh a lot of songs were heavy hitters in that yeah. lynn manuel miranda bringing his a game again I, and just I, uh great stuff i'm pretty sure a lot of those lyrics from hamilton in the heights and in canto are interchangeable like <laughs> he has a certain rhythm when he's writing music. <laughs> it's right. hard not to. I was watching Encanto and I'm like, wait, are we are we talking about Hamilton here? Because this feels Hamilton. Um, well, hell yeah. Do you guys feel good? You feel like you covered a lot? Because I have a question I want to ask, and I can go first to give you time to think about it. But okay. it's a new year, I... new year, new me, right? I want to know mm-hmm. what you guys are pushing forward into into the uh uh, the world what energy you're giving to like what thing do you want to see hit cinema hit video where do you want to go and i'm telling you guys with all of my heart and soul i am willing for halloween three season of the witch dot 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 again evil doesn't die tonight (laughs) that's what that's what i want for 2022 that's my my resolution. Sure. I've read the secret. I'm naming it to the universe. That's what I need. Mm-hmm. I just, I literally want them to go. Oh, you thought we were gonna give you Michael Myers? Go fuck yourselves! It's <laughs> druids, you sons of bitches. They bring Tom Atkins back. You know, whatever. It's nice. It's where I'm at. Uh, sure. Do you guys have anything for 2022 that you would like to will into a film that's coming out or something you would like to see come back? anything like yeah that. i uh i've got one right away because rights issues finally settled on friday the 13th i'm sure there's going to be some appeals but what i'm hopeful for is that this is a quick resolution i'm gonna be honest i don't really have an opinion on who is correct in the situation i just want more friday the 13th because the reboot attempt sequel attempt that they did a few years ago it was like 2013 or something somewhere around there was pretty fucking good for a friday the 13th movie is pretty fun and so here's the thing i just want more of that or maybe let's do another freddy versus jason again i don't care i just need more of it and if we can get robert england back as freddy and maybe we can pull bruce campbell back in his ash we finally see it we finally see the sequel to freddy versus jason it's freddy versus jason versus ash that's what i'm willing into the (laughs) world that's that's the one the goosebumps (laughs) oh Oh, man you know i can't really think of anything offhand i'm really willing to just kind of let uh let the whims of the future fall Mm. as they may uh because we've been I honestly spoiled lately just so many delightful films I mean well like here we are basically at the end and like man like Spider-Man just made like seven billion dollars at the box office <laughs> and we didn't even talk about it and like that uh right. that was great like there's it we've just been like treat after treat after treat in 2021 I I just I can't see how anybody could be cynical about movies after a year like that not just like the big blockbuster shit but like all the other cool stuff we got we got mm-hmm. so much cool shit to watch and oh, uh yeah man <laughs> it's it's been uh it's been great oh, yeah. and i think 2022 is like at this 
at this stage, man, I'm just I'm I'm feeling content and uh, I, I'm down for whatever it wants to throw at us. Uh, like, let's let's see what we got. Let's see. Uh, let's see what hits theaters this year. Hell yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think on that, I think we're somewhere near the end. So I guess I just want to put this out to you. Everyone at home, connoisseurs, we do appreciate you listening as always. We do realize 2021 may have been a rough year for you. It was a rough year for a lot of people. And all we can do is wish that your upcoming year is awesome and is as good as possibly can be. But know this, no matter how rough it gets, you've always got a home here at Bargain Bin. So we appreciate you and we we hope you stick around. Hell yeah. Bye. Happy Bye. New Year 2022. <laughs> May um, na, 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 na. And at last, it's time to go. But remember, friends, this show is made possible by the love and support of listeners like you. Give us a follow and check out our Patreon. And if you can't, hey, that's cool. Just tell a pal. So adieu. Goodbye and adios. We'll see you around the bargain bin.